And what we've done in the church, and much of the church, is we have just made God into another product. In the same way that someone's a BMW will make you happy looking this way, will make you happy and fulfilled, having this relationship will make you happy and fulfilled, having this child will make you happy and fulfilled. We say having Jesus will make you happy and fulfilled. God is not something different. God just operates in the same structure. We're just offering a different product. The church is just a different shop. The worship's just a different jingle. The, the clergy are just different salespeople. We are offering God like someone offers chewing gum, like someone offers a car or a house. God is just the latest thing that will satisfy you, make you whole, and make you complete. And whenever we get the thing that we think will make us happy and we realize it won't, we do one of two things generally. Uh, we either supplement it, we go, okay, I'm not doing it right. You know, I bought this car, oh, no, I need to get a better stereo system, or I need to get an upgraded car, or you know, I need to get better wheels or better hubcaps. And you, you kind of think you've got it, but for some reason it's not quite working, so you've got to do some extra stuff, because you have got the thing which is supposed to make you happy. Or, um, uh, so there's that where you kind of supplement, what else do you do? Or you, you just disavow it. You're so invested that you pretend to yourself that you're happy. You put out this image to other people. Now, in the same way I think in church this kind of happens, is, you know, maybe you enter into this because we think Jesus will make us happy and complete and God will promise us fulfillment. And then, it doesn't work. So maybe I need to pray more. Maybe I need to fast. Maybe I need to read the Bible more. Maybe I need to go to that conference. Maybe I need to buy that new book. Now, my new book will actually satisfy that long <laughs> years ago. It is the one exception to everything that I'm saying, okay? Um, so we want the next best, the next thing, because that, that mustn't be doing it quite right. Or we disavow it. We pretend to ourselves that we're happy. We pretend to ourselves that everything's good, and we make sure we're going to lots of meetings, because if we sit for too long, we might realize that maybe this whole thing didn't make me as complete and whole as I thought. And God becomes, it's like, kind of, well, impotent. It's like, if this is God, something's wrong. So where does Christianity come in? Um, we've, uh, yeah, okay. Where does Christianity come in? Well, I think this whole structure is broken. I think Christ shows an utterly different way to exist. And I'm going to try and express what that is. I think the good news of Christianity is you can't be happy. The gospel is you can't be fulfilled. Life is suffering. Amen. <laughs> now, why is that good news? We'll come to it in a second. But that maybe is the most free and liberating thing of all. Not the freedom to pursue your happiness, but the freedom from the pursuit of your own happiness. And maybe in letting down that desire for fulfillment and happiness, maybe only then can you experience indirectly through the love of another happiness. But anyway, um, the point is, Christ comes in, and we say Christ is without sin, what does that mean? Well, think of sin like, uh, Christ is the sin, what money is to value. Money has no value, but it represents all value, right? Like, I mean, notes have a value if you want to store cocaine or something, it has some value, but literally notes and walls have no value, right? Not so, money has no value, but represents all value. And so in a sense, Christ has no sin, but represents all sin on the cross. Um, also, the other thing, by the way, is, uh, money is a concretization of debt, which is nothingness. Um, you know, money came in as a way of concretizing indebtedness. You have a car, you have 20 chickens. Um, people think that there was an exchange made. Exchanges weren't made. Anthropologists have discovered that there is no society where exchanges like that took place. What they find is, you have a car, you have 20 chickens. You need a car, you don't need any chickens. So you give the car and say, you only want. And then maybe next year, you do need 20 chickens. So you give 20 chickens. In other words, there was this sense of like giving someone in the community that you know there's a little bit of indebtedness there, and eventually you pay it back. Like if you know you go to someone's house for a meal, you don't pay for it. You don't bring out your wallet at the end of the night and try and offer to pay. It'd be awful. But there's a sense in which somewhere down the line you invite them around your house, right? And money came as a way to concretize that debt, that nothingness. So Christ, you know, so money in a sense is concretization of debt. So Christ. We say without sin, which means without the sense of loss, which means without the idol. And by the way, I'd say sin is anything that we try to use to get to the idol, charity, whatever. Just anything we do, we try and get to the thing we really desire. And so Christ is without sin, so without this loss, then doesn't postulate the idol. Then on the cross, we have this idea that, that Christ becomes sin. And where is this shown? It's shown in this cry on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is a sense of separation, of loss. 
And then here's the secret. The temple curtain is ripped in two. The Holy of Holies, that thing behind which God is, that thing, you know, that where only priests go in once a year and then they tied your rope so that they charred up in flames or something, they could be pulled out, right? This is this is where God lives, this is like the Holy of Holies, this is where this is it. And the temple curtain is ripped in two. And what do we find? Nothing. There's no God gas. My friend Jay Baker says it's not every sock you ever lost in the washing machine. You know, it's not all the change you put down the back of the sofa. There's nothing there. What we're separated from is nothing. It's impotence, nothing is itself. This is the death of God in, in theology. Is that suddenly this is the truth is exposed. Whatever it is that we think will satisfy us, will make us complete, that this thing which, which is God, you know, this idol, is nothingness. And God dies and it is finished. Whoa, that's right. Um, and I want to sit with that for a second. And I'm going to take five more minutes than I'm allowed. Because actually it's a bit of a Q&A, so I'm going to cut into that a little bit. Is that okay? Otherwise you're not going to get to the end. And it's, it's good. This is where it starts getting good, I promise. Or you can get your money back. I, I can say that because it's not my money. You can get to hold your money back, right? Um, so it is finished. Now what does this mean? We see the idol is something we think is out there and exists that we can get. But it's somewhat more complicated than that. Um, there's, a, there's a series called The Prisoner from the 1960s, British series, absolutely amazing, wow, oh, so good, written by Patrick McGugan, who was a Christian guy. And it was about this, this secret agent, and at the, the start of every episode was the same. You see him go into the office where he works, he puts down his resignation letter and he leaves. He goes back to his house to pack, and then this gas comes into his house, he, 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 he passes out, and he wakes up in this village where everything is beautiful, everything is perfect. There's no walls, there's, you see, there's like beaches, there's like old people, so everything's taken care of. But it's really insidious, it's awful. And, and actually it is a prison, you can't escape every time you try and get away, this white ball takes you back into it. And, and there's, there's guards, but you don't know who they are. You don't know who the guards and the prisoners are. It's weird. Everything is perfect. Everything is good. And he hits it. And he's given a number. Everyone's given a number. There's no names. And he is number six. And at the beginning, and then in the opening credits, it's like he gets to the village and he gets up and says, where is this? This is the village. What do you want? We want information. Who runs the village? We won't tell you. Um, you are number six. I am number six. Yes, you are number six. Who are you? I am number two, right? And then, and then the guy goes, who is number one? He, goes, he just repeats, you are number six. And, right? and you have this, it's weird. And every episode, he's trying to find out who is number one. Every episode, he's like, who runs the village? Who runs this? Who is it who wants the information? Who is oppressing me? And in the very last episode, we discover the answer. Now, I'm going to tell you the answer, right? And you may be annoyed because I'm telling you the punchline, but it was in the 1960s. The 1960s. If you haven't watched it by now, you're really behind the times, right? And don't get annoyed because you wouldn't have heard of it if I hadn't mentioned it, right? Okay, see? Um, I'm not really giving something away. It's not like I'm going, you know, the kid can see dead people. He's dead. Bruce Willis is dead, you know? They're in the present day. In, the village is in the present day. Uh, and the, so it's not like that, but um, <laughs> it's like, so what happens is, yeah, um, <laughs> the Titanic sits. Um, we built the Titanic, by the way, but we didn't drive it, the English drove it, but we built it. Um, but the, what happens is the very last episode, we discover who number one is. And it's like, who's going to be number one? Well, you know, is it, is it the communists? Is it the, is it the Vietnamese? Is it the big business? You know, whoever the bad guy is. It? And who, is, who runs number one? And the mask is taken off. And it's him. Number six is number one. And it tells you every single episode. Because every single episode he says, who is number one? You are number six. And what happens is there's this Christological moment. Where, where he, number six, is ripped apart from number one, experiences the entire loss. In other words, he is oppressed by his own system that it seems to be perfect and beautiful, just like the idol seems to be perfect and beautiful and out there, and yet somehow it's destructive to us. This village is beautiful and perfect, but somehow it's destructive to us. And it's not created by something out there, it's created by us. 
We create it. We create our own, our own prison. We are enslaved by ourselves. That is what we need to break out of. It's dead. The whole structure is dead. You know the way in church you sometimes have this precipice and we have a happy person there and another precipice and there's God and, and there's little works, little bridges that don't get across and then there's a big bridge, boom, in the middle. But it's true and you go jump across, right? And that's, you know, and I like that imagery except that I don't think it's God on the other side, I think it's the idol. We feel ourselves separated from a chasm, from something that will make us complete and whole. And then, and then what we do is, the church just said, we have the answer, we have the way to get you to, to the idol. And it's Jesus. So in other words, Jesus is like a super works. It's like, it's like whenever, whenever Paul said, love fulfills the law, he doesn't mean that love puts on his big boy pants and, 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 and puts on a cape and says, I am a super love. No, no, no. Love fulfills the law by acting in a different register, by utterly, utterly transcending the law. It fulfills the law by going up to a higher place. Jesus doesn't get you to, doesn't get you to the idol. Jesus destroys this whole structure, destroys the whole thing. It's all a make -believe. That's what the atonement is. It's not like you owe ten thousand dollars and you and you're going to come in and pay it. It's like the year of jubilee. The ten thousand dollars is fiction. It's all forgiven. The debt's forgiven. It's not paid. It's forgiven. It's gone. It's nothing. It's itself. This whole debt that you're struggling with, it's all meaningless. They go, okay, and here's where and here's where it gets interesting. This is where we're going to have to finish, um, but. Oh, but, but we don't stop there. Resurrection. Resurrection. This is a different conception of God. What do we find in the Bible, in this Christological perspective of God, right? Well, here's three things. The idol, this thing we think will fulfill us, right? It exists. In fact, it exists so much that we think nothing else really exists. It stands, to exist means to stand out, right? To exist means something you can hold, you can smell, you can touch, or you can think. Existence is to stand by, literally, the literal meaning to exist, to stand by, right? So the I of stands out, I still want it, but the truth is it doesn't exist. It's a fiction. But we experience it as existing. Secondly, it's sublime. It's beautiful. I just want it so much. I want that fame. I want that child. I want whatever it is so much because that will fulfill, fulfill me. Now, you can have a child because you want a child, but if the child is your idol, the thing that you think will fulfill you, then, you know, post the old depression is going to be awful. Um, so, you got, you just sublime. And thirdly, the idol is meaningful. It's that thing that is, is meaningful above all else, right? <coughs> In Christianity, we see this idea that whenever we say God is love, what does that mean? What does it mean to say God is love? Well, here's three things you can say about love. Love doesn't exist. Now, ironically, like the idol, maybe it's the only thing that does, but, but we don't experience love as existing. You can't objectify love. You can't hold love like this and smell it and touch it and feel it. It's not like the idol. It doesn't exist. <clears throat> love calls everything into existence. When you love, if I see, I see thousands of people every day, but if I love somebody, they're called out. I don't see you. You're like, it's like a cow is in a car. I see, but I don't really perceive. But then when you see someone you love, it's like out of the undulating sea of others, they exist, they, they become something. When you love somebody or a cause, you see it. You see it, it's like in, in Genesis, God calls forth and things come out of this formless void into being, they take shape. Love is like a field mouse in the dark. As soon as you put the torch, gone, and you see just a flicker of a tail. Love brings everything into existence. And that doesn't mean love is not. It just means that the category of existence isn't the right category. That's not the way to think about love. And maybe it's not the right way to think about God. Maybe God is that which calls everything into existence. When we affirm God, we see. We see. Second of all, love is not sublime. Love is not beautiful. Love is what said, look at that person. Look at that cause. They are sublime. They are beautiful. Love isn't saying, look at me. Love is always saying, look at this person in front of you. You know, it's, it's like, love is like the light in this room. You don't see the light. The light enables you to see. When I'm in a bar talking to a friend, I'm not praising the light for allowing it to illuminate my friend. I'm enjoying the company of my friend. But ironically, it's the light that I see. It's only the light that I see. Because it's the light reflected off them into my eyes. So again, ironically, light... Um, you don't see, and yet it's the only thing you do see. It's the thing that enables you to see. And thirdly, love isn't meaningful. Love is what renders the world meaningful. 
See, when you love somebody or something, if you're, if you're falling up, suddenly a meal that's just about getting fuel into your body becomes an act of communion. Suddenly a walk is not just a get from A to B, but it's actually this journey of discovery. When you love, life becomes meaningful. And the weird thing is, if you believe life is meaningful, but you don't love, then you will experience it as meaningless. You can't help it. And funnily enough, if you think the world is meaningless, but you love, you cannot help but experience the world as meaningful. What if the truth of God is not some sort of object out there that, that we try to, try to grasp, like the Jack T. Chick things, where, you know, it's like, it's like Wendy Coyote, right? God is either, we have to renounce God, we're never going to get God, not till the next life. So let's just get along and try and get by. It's like a waiting room. One day we'll be with God, but not today, right? That's kind of rubbish. Or secondly, you can get God as this object, right? And you, you know, you go to a worship service and you experience the presence of God, right? That's even worse sometimes, because, but for two reasons. One is, often you're the person who never has the experience. It's always the guy that's falling over, you know, it's you know. And you, you know, is that funny feeling God, or is that yeah. what I ate, that pizza I ate last night, you know? And, and it's always the other person. So that's like road runner chasing, chasing the road runner, but never getting the road runner. So it's always the other people. And it's even worse if it's you that's having the experience. I come from a charismatic background. You know, I, you know, it's like, you know, hands down for coffee and all of that. I have the experience. But then you go, you wake up the next day and have to make a sandwich and have to get all of life. And you're like, oh, is that it? So you become addicted to the next conference, the next hit. You become, and suddenly everything between is kind of rubbish. Right? Because you're waiting for the next book, the next conference, the next, oh, the next prophetic speaker's coming. And then, oh, that's going to be fantastic. And, and, and actually, the bit of your life that's in between those is kind of a bit rubbish. I think that's awful. But if God is found in love, then the more you love, the more God is there. When you love making your sandwich, when you love going for a walk, when yeah. suddenly God is, is there in the midst. It's a difference between a classical science and quantum mechanics. In classical science, the unknowing, the mystery is on the other side. So, uh, very quickly, um, a scientist should say everything is explainable in the world, but there's one thing that's not explainable, which is the, the, the structure itself. So there's this mystery outside, and everything inside the structure can be understood. In quantum mechanics, they realize, no, the mystery is not outside the system. The mystery is within the system itself. There's something within the system that cannot be uh, Kind of, we cannot fully grasp Heisenberg's own certainty principle and stuff. There's, there's a certain unknowing that's built into the structure of the universe itself. The mystery is not out there. The mystery is now dwelling among us, right? That's the same with love. When you love somebody, if I desire something I don't have, like I desire this water, I desire it because I don't have it. And then when I have it, I don't desire it anymore. I, I have it, right? But not with love. You see, if, if you just stood up with somebody and you're looking for someone to go out with, everybody keeps away from you, you know? And because everyone knows that they know that you don't desire them, you desire what function they will provide for you. They'll keep you company, they'll make you feel better, right? The very point when you don't need the person, that's when you're more likely to find someone. Because when you find them, they you know that you know, you're not just needing them because, because you need somebody, but you're actually sparking off the need. The person you love does not satisfy your desire, they birth your desire. The, 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 the truth of the beloved is, I never knew I needed you until I met you, and now that I met you, I realized I always needed you. In other words, it's retroactively given. It's like, you birth, and why? Because human beings are like guitarists and Doctor Who. It's like, on the outside, it's a tiny box, but on the inside, it goes on forever and ever. Your, the fleshly frame of your beloved opens up to an interior inner world of, of, of infinite proportions. We are a universe. We are all the universe. So the two, the, that, this is why you know, this is, you know, the two come, you know, you can have, uh, you know, Jesus is there and yet to come. So of, when your beloved is there, they are experiences to come. Their experience is not yet there. But you can't have the experiences and not let the air there until they're there. Right? The desire is birth. And think about the incarnation. The mystery of God is not revealed in Christ. The mystery dwells among us. It's here with us. The mystery infuses this universe. So I, I, what I'm postulating here is that actually the truth of Christianity is, is that you can't be happy, you can't be fulfilled. There's no object that's going to satisfy you. There's no object that's going to make you complete. That's impotent. Whatever you think it is, whether it's BMW or I or God, it's not going to do it. Do you know what? If you lay all of that down, if you try to sensitize yourself in love to the people around you, and you try to 
accept the darkness and, and bring that to light and what's going on. You try to create a place of grace where you can speak and you can be honest about your difficulties and your struggles and your sadness and your broken hearts. Perhaps in that very place of giving up the pursuit of this, this thing will make me happy and just finding love in a community, there you find fulfillment. There you will indirectly, without even realizing it, happiness will creep up on you. And you won't even know it. And perhaps in the very space of giving up God as an idol, as an object that will satisfy you, Bonhoeffer called Des Ex Machina, perhaps there, crazily, that's the very place, the very place where you will find God at work, moving and being and healing and bringing salvation. There you go. Okay, thank you. Um,